In the first part of this short presentation, I would like to reflect on, particularly on the chapter that I was a CLA of with my colleague Nathan Bindoff from the University of Tasmania, the chapter on chapter 10 on detection and attribution of climate change from global to regional. And you can see also there our other colleagues, the other lead authors on that chapter. But also to think ahead and also to, to um, expand, I think, really a bit on what Thomas has just said around the challenges around detection attribution on the regional scales and around what this means in terms of the extremes happening regionally around the world um, at the moment uh, as we go forward year by year. And in order to um, start that conversation, if you like, I want to particularly highlight a couple of new or, or a new initiative that I've been involved in with colleagues from NOAA and many colleagues actually, some colleagues in this room who've contributed to this new type of report which looks back every year at the previous year and seeks to explain extreme events of the previous year from a climate perspective. Um, so I, I thought I would just start off by just saying a few words about what we mean when we talk about attribution. Um, so to do attribution, to, to, to ask this question, what has caused observed changes in climate, we need estimates of the expected changes, the exchanges we would expect due to different factors. And these, of course, include both uh, the consequences of the increased greenhouse gas concentrations that we saw about earlier, um, also natural factors, natural external influences on the climate system, such as, for example, changing solar output. It's very well established that the output from the sun varies on an 11-year cycle and, and also varies on longer timescales as well and also um, explosive volcanic eruptions, and to look at these different factors and therefore estimate these so-called fingerprints, our expected changes that we would expect to see in the climate system, in the, in the observations, if these are major contributors. And therefore, an observed change is attributed to a particular factor if the observed changes are consistent with the expected changes that include the relevant fingerprint and inconsistent with expected changes that exclude that fingerprint. And we have a basic null hypothesis, which is that we can explain the observed changes purely by natural internal variability, for example, due to ENSO variability, for example, or some of the, the, the well-established multi-decadal scale modes of variability, such as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, for example. And then attribution more specifically is, is, is a process of evaluating the relative contributions quantitatively of multiple causal factors to a change or event with an assignment of statistical confidence. And therefore attribution brings together statistical analysis with physical understanding, which crucially must underpin robust statements around uh, causes of change. And this, um, these definitions of... of um, Attribution were formalised in a, in a good practice guidance paper that, that the IPCC, uh, that, that IPCC authors put together back in 2010. So in order to, uh, to show you an illustration of, of, of this, uh, what we're seeing here is the observed global mean temperature changes uh, year by year. Um, you can, that's the black line there, so you can see the, 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 the warming, the, the, the warming that we've talked about. You can see, so on the left panel there, we've got the global mean changes. In the middle panel, we've got the changes over land. Uh, and on the right, we've got the, the changes over the oceans. You can see the, the, the overall warming. You can see there is variability within that, both year to year and decade to decade. And then on top of that, overlaying on that, we have these CMIT-5 model simulations, the couple model simulations in blue that just include natural Factors. They include changing solar output, they include explosive volcanic eruptions. You can see the, the cooling effect there in 1991 from Mount Pinatubo, the last major explosive eruption that, that the world saw. Um, those models are free running, so they have, en they have El Niños and La Niñas uh, as emergent properties of those models. But you can see that none of those models capture the observed warming. On the other hand, when the models also include increasing greenhouse gas concentrations um, and uh, also include other anthropogenic factors in addition to the natural factors, then you can see that the, the warming is captured. Um, 
and you can see also that that, that pattern, already we're starting to see a fingerprint here because you can see that the warming over land has been greater than the warming over the ocean and also that basic feature is an expected fingerprint of the, uh, the anthropogenic changes that you can see there. Now, in order to, 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 to quantify these fingerprints in the observations, we, we need to use not just temporal information, important though that is, but also spatial information. I've already referred to the differences between the land and the ocean. And so this is, this is actually one of these frequently asked uh, questions. It's an illustration from the frequently asked questions. This is a, a good resource, actually, in the IPCC report, so I encourage you to go and look at those. Um, so this is frequently asked question 10.1, figure 1, and it shows on the left uh, a version of the figure I've just shown you, and on the right it shows the spatial patterns of temperature change near the surface of the Earth in the middle as observed since 1951, and at the top the, the expected fingerprint from natural forcings, and at the bottom the expected fingerprint from the combined role of natural and anthropogenic forcings. And it's when you put those fingerprints together with the actual observations has actually happened, and then you can make a, uh, a, a carefully statistically um, um, based statement around to what extent you can then explain the observations. So this is the figure that Thomas showed in his presentation. So underpinning that, this is not purely a model-based result. This is based on saying how, if you combine the observations with the models, to what extent has the fingerprint of greenhouse gases emerged in the observations? And therefore, to what extent the observations constrain what must have gone into what's actually happened? And that underpins those results, which you've already seen. You can see the, the greenhouse gases there in green. Uh, as Thomas said, they, they explain rather more than the observed warming because it has been balanced by some uh, other anthropogenic factors dominated by the cooling effect of aerosols. Like I say, there are uncertainties in that, and those uncertainties come from the fact that the, 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 we have some information, important information from these fingerprints that say, well, we cannot explain the observations any other way than by saying we must have this substantial greenhouse gas component, but there is still some remaining uncertainty related to the, to some extent, to, to the degeneracy, if you like, between how much warming from greenhouse gases we, can ex we need to explain the observations and how much cooling from other anthropogenic factors. But you'll see that natural factors, while they contribute uh, quite substantially on year to year and even decade to decade timescales, on these longer timescales, on 60 years, they make a rather small contribution. Um, now, as uh, Thomas has already said, the, the evidence doesn't just come from the surface temperature observations, but comes from other sources. And, and this is a figure taken from chapter 10. And this is actually an important area of advance since the fourth assessment report. And this actually comes about largely, I would say, from advances in our observational understanding. So there were, there were we, Thomas already referred to observational uncertainties. We had uncertainties around the observational um, measuring errors around the expendable bathythermograph measurements of the ocean temperatures. So we've understood more about that now. And therefore, we have more confidence in our attribution of warming of the upper ocean, which is what's shown on the top panel there. And this shows in the same sort of format the observations of upper ocean heat content. The blue are the model simulations with just natural factors. The red are the model simulations with both anthropogenic and natural factors. You can see that we can only explain the observed warming of the ocean in terms of uh, the, the, that additional anthropogenic contribution, albeit that you can also see the effects again of the volcanic explosive, explosive volcanic eruptions. The bottom panel shows this presented another way, it represents the statistical level of confidence we can have in these results. This is the signal to noise ratio. To what extent is this fingerprint emerged from the noise of natural internal variability? You can see as we go forward in time and we take longer trend lengths, starting in 1970, going to the date shown on the x-axis there, we can see that we have increasing levels of confidence. The, as a quick aside, the, 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 the dotted lines that go below, oops, sorry, that go, uh, let's see if we can go back. Let's press on. The, <laughs> the, um, what I was just about to say was the, the levels with the lower signal to noise were the older observational data sets. So one advance, important advance there was our greater observational understanding, underscoring this importance of the observational record uh, and, and the continuing uh, that we continue to develop that. 
Um, we heard about the water cycle earlier. earlier. We have made important advances in our understanding about the global water cycle. Um, we have observed increases in atmospheric moisture. We have global scale precipitation patterns over land. We've seen intensification of heavy precipitation over land regions where data is sufficient. And we've also seen ocean salinity changes where the large scale climatological pattern of fresher regions and more salty regions over the ocean, that climatological pattern has become enhanced as a result of changes in the, in the global water cycle. And so if we put all that evidence together, we synthesize that evidence, we have greater confidence expressed in this statement, likely greater than 90% confidence that anthropogenic influence have, has affected the global water cycle. If we go forward then to, to look at some evidence around extremes, um, this is from work by Francis Vias, who shows if you collect all the data that we have from across the world in terms of the hottest days and nights, so we look at the maximum daily temperatures, the minimum daily temperatures, and look at the hottest days and nights of the year, collect all that data over the, over the globe where we have it, which is largely dominated actually by the, the Northern Hemisphere, but as you can see also Southern Africa and South America, Australia, then we can see that those days that climatologically uh, were expected to happen once in 20 years, the hottest days and nights have now reduced to fewer than 10 years and 15 years respectively in many places. So that shows how uh, climate change has altered the occurrence of these types of, of measures of extremes. So this is, this is some of the underpinning evidence that comes to the conclusion around human influence on the climate system is clear because we have detected those fingerprints in warming of the atmosphere in the ocean, in changes in the global water cycle, in reductions in snow and ice, in global mean sea level rise, and in changes in some climate extremes. This evidence from across the climate system has grown since AL4, and therefore it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause. Now I did want to get on now to talk about what does this mean for the regions, what does this mean for extremes? And just to motivate this discussion, just give you a couple of examples. Australia had an extremely hot year in 2013. It had the hottest summer in record. Um, this is a picture on the bottom left taken from the, uh, by a colleague at the IPCC lead author meeting we had in Hobart, Tasmania, looking across Hobart Bay towards the fires on the Tasman Peninsula. And on the right is the Holmes family that needed to, to flee their house in those fires. They all, they all survived and they've told their tales in a rather good interactive um, story coming out of the Guardian actually, there's a lot of information about, about them. Um, we had a very wet winter here of course, the last winter in the UK. Um, the wettest winter in England and Wales since 1766 in the record that we keep at the Met Office. Um, and which led among other things of course to the Dawlish railway line being washed away and to uh, the flooding, extensive flooding on the Somerset levels. I could of course make many more examples, I'm not, I'm not elevating these examples as more or less important than others, but I just, I'm just bringing these to, to say that it's, it, it's at times like this that people, policymakers, planners, want information about how does this relate to climate change and climate variability. Um, we, d we, we, um, we showed the sort of way that we can do this, myself and Miles Allen and Dahi Stone from the University of Oxford, we showed how we could relate the European heat wave of 2003, these shows the temperatures in Europe year by year up to the 2003, okay, how we could relate that to what we would expect from natural, uh, if, if, if we purely had natural climate variability, and that's shown in the green, uh, and what we would expect with ongoing climate change, and that's the distribution shown in the red. Um, and we showed that by, by making a careful uh, attribution statement, we could show how the risk of such an event had changed. And we showed in that paper that it is very likely that the probability of that event had more than doubled. And that's shown in the top right panel where we've shown the distribution from the green distribution to the red distribution, how that has shifted. Uh, and that has had significant effects on the likelihood of having such a heat wave. If you look at what's happened since, we've seen that we've We've, we've, we've continued on the trend line that we were already on in 2003, and if you put that into the context of what we're expecting in the future, with the observations that we've had in the 10 years since we wrote that paper, we see that there is nothing to contradict what we said 10 years ago around European summer temperatures being on track to become potentially the norm. When expressed as this large-scale seasonal mean average by um, not that far into the future. So in order to bring these types of study together, we have this new report. 
Uh, the very first report, we had a rather small number of articles. It got a lot of interest from the scientific community and, and more widespread. And now we've taken this forward to, a, to further reports. So there was a report looking back at 2012. Uh, we found evidence in some cases for human influence of changing the risk. We find other cases where natural variability was playing a bigger role. In all cases, we found that it was both natural variability and anthropogenic climate change that was potentially having a role, but certainly natural climate variability was a factor in all events. Um, and therefore, to come to what I think for the future, human influence on the climate system is clear, but as Thomas said earlier, there's a lot more work to do to understand how this is affecting us regionally. What is our vulnerability to extremes in a changing climate system? We believe that operational attribution systems can provide regular assessments of attributable risk of extreme events, but we also think strongly that further development of the models, the observations, and the understanding is required to ask these very challenging scientific questions. If you think about the wet winter here in the UK, that's a very good example of where it's challenging our understanding and observations and provides a really interesting scientific study. So I just wanted to do a quick plug for our European project called Euclair, which aims to develop this ability to provide these types of assessments. And I'll stop there and invite questions. Thank you.